I don't know exactly why I did this, but I did it, and it works. It works really well, actually. So I guess I should tell you about it. Let's get undone. Gerald Undone. He's crazy. What's happening, everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and this intro thing is a bit confusing for new people. So back at NAB, Atomos showed off their new Shogun 7 monitor recorder, which, along with a great new screen, came the promise of a firmware update that would allow for the recording and switching of four independent video streams. Well, that firmware has finally been released, and so I figured it'd be fun to test out those switching capabilities. Now, this is not a sponsored video, I was just interested in satisfying my own personal curiosity, and figured you guys might want to know too. But fair warning, if you're a hybrid shooter like me, you're going to need some extra cables and converters, because the switching is done over the SDI ports on the Shogun. So I've got four cameras running for this test. I've got the Blackmagic Pocket 4K as camera one, a Sony a7 III over there, a Sony a6600 above my head, and another Sony a7 III right here filming the Shogun 7. Now none of these cameras have SDI outputs, so each of their HDMI outputs is running to one of these HDMI SDI converters from Atomos. Now these things are pretty cool. You can either power them with the included DC plug to mains power wall adapter, or you can use this USB setup that I have here. And you also get these little bracket plates here, plus a little lock for your HDMI cables. Now, the way that I have it set up is I'm using four micro USB ports connected over here to my anchor. Now it doesn't come with the USB cables, just the DC cable. So I connected them all using random micro B cables that I had laying around into this anchor five port USB charger. Big fan of this thing, by the way, it's got four four USB-A ports and then one USB Type-C with power delivery and it's very handy as part of my charging station. Anyway, so that gives them all power and then we just run an SDI cable from each of their outputs to the inputs on the Shogun. Now the Shogun has inputs for up to 12G speeds, but for this all four inputs will only be running at 3G because that's all we need for this as the four-way switcher is comprised of four 1080p feeds because one 4K span has the same area as four 1080p inner boxes. Now these converters also cap out at 3G, which is fine because getting faster converters would be a waste of money for this purpose, but this also means that we need to set our cameras to 1080p because in order for this to work, each camera must be outputting the same resolution and frame rate as the others in the system. Now that's no big deal, but it did require me to change some settings around on my cameras, where one of the things that I really liked about the Ada Mini from Blackmagic is that each HDMI port can be scaled separately on the switcher side to match the master settings without requiring you to change it in your camera. Now the Shogun 7 doesn't obviously directly compare to the Ada Mini, as this is a monitor recorder, and this is just a switcher board, but I thought it was worth noting. I suppose to achieve a similar convenience in this configuration, each of our HDMI converter boxes would need to be scalar boxes instead, but again, a few menu tweaks is probably worth the cost savings of using basic converters. So I'd rather save the money and then just change the settings on the Sony's. Now once we have all that done, we go into the input settings on the Shogun and change it over to the switcher mode and then it puts them all together. Now I'm going to have to stop the recording on the Shogun in order to show you this and I'm going to get to this point a little bit later on as to why I'm recording things a little bit weird in here. So let's go in and stop the recording and then we'll go back in and choose input and now if I tap on this you can see that we're on switching 4 times 3G SDI and you can go through obviously you could choose just the HDMI option which would allow you to use the HDMI in on the side which is exactly like you would use with say a Ninja and then you can also do quad link and dual link SDI as well as individual SDI ports as well either the 12G1 or 12G2 you can't use the last two individually but you can use those for dual and quad link but we'll choose the switching one and then that sets them all up and then that gets you into this situation here. Now let's go in and continue recording from here. A little clap check. Sync. Now, like I was saying, the HDMI port isn't involved in the switcher combination. The HDMI is just used for a single camera recording, just like it would be on the Ninja. But we can also use the HDMI out port on the side to send the entire program to another monitor, while you keep the switching interface up on the Shogun, and that way you can preview the final result on a bigger screen while switching on this one. It's a good implementation and a thorough use of all the available connections. Now, when it comes to recording, the Shogun 7 can actually record five streams, each of the four unmodified 1080p feeds from the cameras, plus a program recording that has all your switches baked in. It also writes an XML file for easy importing as a timeline in Final Cut or DaVinci Resolve, which will apply your transitions. I think you can get this to work in Premiere, but you'll probably have to convert the file first, as Premiere doesn't seem to natively recognize the FCP XML extension. 
and these XMLs are the only way to restore the transitions captured on the Shogun. You can set a fade between switches, but it's only metadata and not baked into the program. In fact, you can't even see it on your program monitor, it just shows a hard cut during the preview. Let me show you an example of this. So I've got the Shogun here, and I'm gonna plug this into the HDMI out port so that we can do that secondary monitor thing that I was talking about. And while this boots up, I'll show you the transition. So if we go in here, we can see switching. I have it set to XML dissolve, and then you can set it to automatically do it based on a certain number of frames or a certain number of seconds. The, you can also set it to manual, which when you switch, it looks like this. So if you tap, you manually dissolve however long you want it to take. And the other options in here are one touch, hard cut, no cue. So just boom, 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 boom. We're just switching like that, and it just cuts. And then we also have the option of two touch hard cut with Q. So that one's gonna be like this. It goes green, but it hasn't cut over yet. And then we tap it again and then it cuts. So like Q it up, then cut it. Q it up, then cut it. Now, what I was saying was that the transitions don't actually show up on your preview. So I have the preview of our program showing here on the Shinobi. And as you can see, if I go to transition by tapping on this, so it shows you how long it's gonna be. You can change it in here, this is auto. You can change it again to manual, change the amount of frames. And if I press go, then that's when the transition will take place. But on the Shinobi, you can see it's not doing anything. It just, psh, just cuts like that. Now, when you switch here on the Shogun, you'll see a flash of black before it goes the other one. The flash of black will not show up on the preview. This is just on this screen loading the full feed. So that's fine, but the transitions aren't displayed here. Now this is one area that I was expecting to be a bit more robust. I think having the XML transitions is great, but it would have also been great to see a baked in dissolve option so that you could use this device live. I mean, you can still use it live and all the features will work. The only drawback is your audience will only see hard cuts because the transitions aren't applied until popped open in edit. However, an inclusion that I do appreciate is the ability to grab all of your audio streams from your cameras and have the audio follow the video while switching. So if you go in here and look at the audio settings, you can see that we have all of our different cameras are capturing the audio. Now in order to get this to work, I suggest that you disable the recording for analog here. As you can see, mine are turned off. Because if you leave it turned on, especially when you import this timeline into Resolve, what will happen is the analog track will get assigned to channel one and two, and then your switching track will get assigned to channel three. And Resolve won't know what to do with this when it imports a timeline because it'll look for the switching track on one and two and then not see it and you'll just get silence because your analog track wasn't recording anything. So if you disable these two, then it's able to switch between the four and put them on the correct track. So if you ever had any problems with importing XMLs into DaVinci Resolve, that might be what your problem is if you're not hearing any audio. So disable that and then you'll get four video feeds, four audio feeds, and a program that follows them both perfectly. Like this. Audio and video from camera one, from camera two, from camera three, and from camera four. Now if you don't want to have the audio follow the video, then you have two options. Record your audio separately as you were before and sync it up in post the same way as usual. Or now you can re-enable that analog track and record directly into the Shogun because this device supports XLR mics and provides phantom power. However, there is a big caveat to that which kind of annoyed me. There's no breakout cable included this time around. There was on the previous Shoguns, but they took it out on this model. So you'll have to buy it for like $150 separately. The breakout cable, by the way, converts this mini connector into proper XLR leads. And this irked me because that breakout cable is notoriously wonky. It's designed in a way that puts unnecessary strain on this tiny port and costs way more than it should. So although I like the capabilities of the internal audio on the Shogun 7, I'd rather just record externally to a mix pre or zoom. I think that's a better use of the $150 and will provide more secure connections. Now you might have noticed that this video is in 4K, but I just said that the program is recorded in 1080p. And that's because I'm actually doing a bit of an overkill configuration here. On the Sony cameras, I'm actually running their HDMI to a Ninja 5 first so that I can record a DNX master on each Ninja while simultaneously sending out the feed to the Shogun out of their HDMI outputs. And on the Blackmagic, I'm recording its 4K feed to the SSD attached to it. Now I figured this would be a safer bet since I've been going through the options and settings on the Shogun and I wouldn't want to accidentally kill the recording and lose that footage while adjusting the settings. And as you saw, in order to show you the input options, I had to actually stop the recording. And yes, this did add a little bit of extra latency to my setup, but overall it was still very responsive. You can probably see here on the little screen versus the big screen what the latency is like. But if you'd like to see how the 1080p program, once upscaled to 4K, stacks up against the separate 4K recordings, here's a comparison.
Now, although it is convenient that I can use the Ninja 5 to see myself on that camera over there because I otherwise wouldn't be able to, and also bypass the recording limit on the a7 III, I did run into some issues. If I wanted to record a 4K feed on the Ninja 5 and send an HD feed here, because like I said, all these have to be 1080p, they all have to be the same, I thought that the best way to do this would be to send 4K to the Ninja 5 and then use the Ninja 5's internal downscaling where you can send HD out of the HDMI while taking in 4K. Unfortunately, that didn't work with these scalers. There's something going on in the Ninja 5, the way that it outputs the HD isn't the same as the HD coming out of the camera directly. So to give you an example here, on this one I'm not even using it because it just was giving me non-stop problems. But I have an HDMI cable here running right out of the camera. If I ran from the camera into the Ninja 5, even if I only had it on HD, even if I didn't use the 4K to HD downsampling, and then ran the HDMI out into this box, it just wouldn't really work. If I stayed on 1080p, it worked more reliably, like 65% of the time, but if I did 4K into the Ninja and then 1080p out into the converter box, it would only work like 20% of the time, a lot of going black and coming back. And it doesn't really make any sense to me because it's supposed to be the same 23.98 frames per second 1080p, but there must be something different about how it's coming out of the Ninja 5 versus how it's coming out of the camera because it didn't work unless I plugged directly into the camera reliably. So just something to note if you plan on doing a similar setup like this where you need 14 Atomos products in order to record your video for some reason, there are some issues in the HD pass-through from the Ninja 5 going into the converter boxes. And I've had similar problems in the past going from the Ninja 5 to a capture card. So I think there's something funky with the HDMI out on the Ninja 5 that it only seems to work with certain devices. Must be an HDMI handshake thing, because it works fine going into the Shinobi, but it doesn't work going into a bunch of other devices. And speaking of the Ninja 5, one of the things I was eager to test out on the Shogun 7 was to see if Atomos implemented anything to deal with the data levels issue with log recordings over HDMI. I don't want to get too deep into this topic on this video, but as I'm sure some of you are aware, if you compare log recordings taken off the SD card and compare them to the ones taken from the Ninja 5 or most other recorders, you'll notice the Atomos recordings are contrastier. And this is because the video range is being incorrectly assigned because HDMI has no way of communicating the metadata to signal the proper data range of the files. In Resolve, this means you have to go in and change the clips back to full manually to have them match the internal recordings, but this requires LUTs or conversions if you're using Premiere or Final Cut. However, some competing recorders have implemented HDMI range options through firmware updates as a way to solve this by writing flags into the recording so the NLEs know how to interpret the footage correctly. So this made me curious if the Atomos had something like that now too. It doesn't. And I know this has nothing to do with switching, but I think this is an important thing to drive home that's been ongoing for probably five years now and needs a firmware solution. So if anyone from Atomos is watching this, give us an HDMI range control. It would save time and create a more even result across the different NLEs. And as it relates to switching, it's not easy to change clip attributes and resolve of an imported XML timeline with adaptive track pairings without breaking the switched program because the option is grayed out unless you insert the original streams, which somewhat undermines the convenience of of using a switcher in the first place, and a simple HDMI range control would fix this. However, to end on a high note, one thing the Shogun does have over the competition is price. Right now on B&H, the Shogun 7 is $1,300, and the competing product from Convergent is about $1,000 more. And the screen on the Shogun is just fantastic. It has a peak brightness of 3,000 nits, which is double the 1,500 nits it was announced with before the firmware update. It has impressively tight zone-based dimming, and the same terrific UI and tools I've come to love on the Ninja 5. I do wish it had baked in transitions for live streaming, but if all you're doing is live streaming, I think the Aiden Mini is a better choice, because the Shogun 7 would still require a capture card as it has no means to integrate with a computer. And as you might have noticed, because of that much brighter screen and richer features, it runs hotter and has a noisier fan. And I only have the brightness set to 10% by the way. This is what it looks like fully juiced up, and if I left it like that it would get much louder, which is why this device is something you'd probably want on that side of the camera, or at least not in the direct path of your microphone. But this is still a very useful device with capabilities that can't be easily matched, at least not at this price point. Prior to this, I attempted to pair the Ada Mini with the Ninja 5 for some kind of Frankenstein version of the Shogun 7, which worked, but it only allowed me to record the program and not the four separate feeds as well, like the Shogun does. Before the switching capabilities were added via firmware, the Shogun 7 was a great recorder with a nice screen at an okay price, but now, with the switching update, it offers arguably the best value in its class. Which somewhat undermines the convenience of using a switcher in the first place, 
first placed. Oh, that was such a good take on the Shogun and This is such a frustrating video to record right now. Everything's making sound effects. My stool keeps squeaking. My wrist keeps making cracking sounds just like a Going on all the time and I feel like you can hear it in the takes, but I'm not really sure so I keep redoing them And if I left it like that, it would get getch. It would getch. It's gonna get ya. Gonna leave it like that. I'm gonna get ya. But that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, well, this aggression will not stand, man. All right, I'm done.